live, Rebecca? Yes, Okay. Uh, well, good afternoon, members, officers, and any members of the public who are viewing the live stream. I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to this meeting of the South Cambridgeshire District Council Scrutiny and Overview Committee. My name is Councillor Grenville Chamberlain, and I have the privilege of being the chair of this committee. Uh, can I remind those members in the chamber that everything on the desk, including your laptop screen, may be broadcast at some point. The camera will follow the microphone being switched on, so councillors and officers are requested to wait just a couple of seconds before speaking to allow the camera to catch up. If the fire alarm sounds, then please leave the chamber by the door next near the top table and make your way down the stairs. Do not use the lift. The safe assembly point is next to the marketing suite, halfway along the business park. Whilst in the building, face coverings must be worn. And where possible, masks should be kept on while speaking. A supply of FFP2 masks is available on the table near the entrance to the chamber. During the course of the meeting, the chamber doors will be propped open to enable greater air circulation. Please follow the one-way system by using the door near the public staircase to enter the chamber and the door opposite the kitchenette near the top table to exit. If this looks like being a long meeting, and in particular in recognition that those present are wearing masks, then we may take a short break so that you can go out for some fresh air if you so desire. And may I remind those joining the meeting via the live stream, please indicate that you wish to speak by the chat column. Please do not use the chat column for any other purpose. Make sure that your device is fully charged and that your microphone is switched off unless you are invited to speak. And please ensure that you've switched off or silenced any other devices you have so that they do not interrupt proceedings. And if you have one available, please use a headset when speaking and hold the microphone close to your, ma close to your mouth. When you are invited to address the meeting, please make sure your microphone is switched on and when you finish addressing the meeting, please turn off your microphone immediately. Um, please speak slowly and clearly and do not talk over or interrupt anyone. And if there are any committee members present on Teams, may I ask you to introduce yourselves? May you, will you just confirm, please, if there are any committee members who are joining yes. remotely? I ask you to introduce I know Councillor Cathcart is there. Yeah. Councillor Van der Weyer, I see, is there. Um, I'm attending remotely, if that's okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, committee members present in the chamber, I will now invite each of you. Yeah. Oh, is it not? Camera. The camera is not on me. Okay. <laughs> I've been empty chaired. <laughs> At committee members present in the chamber, I will now invite each of you to introduce yourselves. Members, after I call your name, please turn on your microphone, wait two seconds and say your name so that your presence may be noted. As I said earlier, my name is Councillor Grenville Chamberlain and I am the member for Hardwick Ward. Uh, my Vice Chair, Councillor Judith Rippeth, cannot be here today, so are members happy for Councillor Steve Hunt to act as Vice Chair for this meeting? I certainly am. Has everyone agreed? Thank you very much, Steve, for doing so. And now may I invite you to introduce yourself, please. Yes, thank you, Chair. My name is Steve Hunt, and I'm one of the councillors for Histon, Impington, and Orchard Park. Thank you, Steve. We now Councillor Anna Bradnam. Sorry, um, two things. One is uh, Councillor Anna Bradnam from Milton and Waterbeach Ward, um, but I just wanted to point out it's possible that if the chairman moved the, used a different microphone than the one applicable to the chair. This is, is the one. It is the. It is the right. Okay, I just wondered. It wouldn't follow you if it wasn't the right one. No, microphone. it is the chair's microphone. Okay, thank you, Councillor Dr. Martin Khan. 
Uh, Councillor Dr. Martin Kahn, uh, member for Histam in Pinkin and Orchard Park. Thank you, Martin. Councillor Nigel Cathcart. Um, Nigel Cathcart, member for Bassingbourne. Thank you, Nigel. Councillor Graham Cohn. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, member for um, Fenditton and Fulbourne Ward, one of the members. Thank you. Councillor Dr. Claire Daunton. Thank you. Um, Claire Daunton, uh, another of the members for the Fenditton and Fulbourne Ward. Thank you. Councillor Peter Fane. Peter Fane, Shelford Ward. Thank you, Peter. Councillor Joe Hales. Nice to see you. Councillor Sally Ann Hart. Thank you, Chair. Sally Ann Hart, the other um, member for Melbourne Ward. Thank you. Councillor Alex Malliam. Thank you. Councillor Dr. Aidan van der Weyer. Uh, good evening. Yes, I'm uh, Aidan van der Weyer from Barrington Ward. Thank you, Aidan. And Councillor Dr. Richard Williams. Thank you, Chair. I'm Richard Williams. I'm the member for Whittlesford, Triplo, Heathfield and Newton. Thank you very much. Now, we are blessed with the company of some uh, senior members of the Council here today with us. Firstly, we have the leader, Councillor Bridget Smith. Thank you. Um, Sorry, Chairman. If, if any of the members' microphones are not working, the online people listening will not be able to hear what they say. Oh, indeed. So we do need to sort that out before we proceed. Okay. Um, so we've got Councillor Bridget Smith's microphone is not working. Yours is okay. Is, is yours working, Alex? On the left hand side. No, we need to get um, Rebecca to sort that card out, if you would. Rebecca, thank you. We'll just hold on a moment or two, members, whilst, uh, whilst this is resolved. Now look. Yes, of course. Late members, we're going to adjourn just for a couple of minutes whilst we sort out this IT. Please bear with us.
Thank you very much indeed, ladies and gentlemen. My apologies for the delay, um, but let us continue with the meeting. Um, I was seeking confirmation of those members of the Cabinet who are with us, and we have here with us in the room Councillor John Williams. John, perhaps you'd like to just introduce yourself, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, Councillor John Williams, I'm a member for Fenditton and Fulbourne Ward. I'm also the lead Cabinet member for Finance. Thank you very much, John. And joining us remotely from the <coughs> Cabinet, we have Councillor Neil Goff. Neil, would you care to introduce yourself, please? Uh, good evening, Chair. Yes, Neil Goff, uh, member for Cottenham and uh, Deputy Leader. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Peter MacDonald. Peter MacDonald? MacDonald? Sorry. Yes, good evening. Good evening, Chair. Um, thank you very much. I'm Peter MacDonald, uh, Cabinet Member for uh, Business Support Economic Recovery. And under item three, uh, I'll wait. I should declare an interest. Thank you very much. Uh, and Councillor Toomey Hawkins. Uh, good evening, uh, Chairman. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Toomey Hawkins, uh, Cabinet Member for Planning and Member for Colico Ward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any other councillors present remotely, please? No, thank you very much indeed. So we now have a number of officers with us this evening. And I'd like to welcome them all and start with uh, our Chief Executive, Liz Watts. You're very evening, welcome, Chair. Liz. Good evening and good evening, members. Thank you. We also have uh, Chief Operating Officer, Anne Ainsworth. Anne, you're very welcome. Uh, we have Gareth Bell. Peter Maddock is the Head of Finance. And I believe Steve and Kelly may join us at some point. We also have Bode Sand. Bode, you're very welcome. Have I missed anyone out? No? Good. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, could I ask if at any time a member leaves the meeting, would they please make that fact known to me so that it can be recorded in the minutes? Item two on our agenda today is apologies for absence. Ian, can you please uh, let us know the who has sent their apologies, please? Certainly. Apologies from councillors Chong Johnson, Harvey and Ripeth. And there are two substitutes today. They are councillors Malian and councillor Hales. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, thank you for um, substituting. You're very welcome. Uh, may I ask under item three, do any members have interest to declare in relation to any item of business on this agenda? But if an interest subsequently becomes apparent later in the meeting, please would you raise it at that point? But are there any declarations of interest, please? Um, yes, Chair. I, I probably should declare interest as Chair of uh, the County Highways Committee when we're coming on to civil parking enforcement. Thank you very much, Peter. Are there any other declarations of interest? No. Thank uh, you much. Chair, Chair, sorry, Chair, sorry uh, in, in the same spirit, uh, Neil Goff here, I should probably uh, at least note that uh, I am the Vice Chair of the Greater Cambridge Partnership and obviously a member of the County Council as well in relation to item six. Thank you very much, Councillor Goff. Yeah, please do. Please can I um, remind remote task participants to use the chat function, not raising the hand, because the hands are not always visible for everybody at any given time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, item four on the agenda is the minutes of the previous meeting. That was held on the 16th of December. Can I go through page by page for accuracy, please, on page one? Page Chair, Mike, I just please ask if um, when people are speaking, would it be possible for them to take their uh, mask off? Otherwise, it's quite difficult to hear it. I agree. Thank, Thank you. Page one. Page two, Anna. Sorry, Chair. My observation is on page 11. Do you want to wait until... Oh, we haven't got there yet. <laughs> we'll be there shortly, I hope. Page three. Page four. 
page 5, page 6, page 7, page 8, page 9, page 10, and page 11. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's, um, it may have occurred like this, but I'm not sure, so I just wanted to check. On page 11, mm -hmm. um, at the top, we have a supplementary question from um, uh, Jane Williams, who previously asked her question on page 10. Yep. And we have a paragraph which starts, NECAP Vision Regulation 19, page 33, and it ends on, would any committee members live on this site? And I just draw your attention to that, which is repeated on page 12, around halfway down the page. And I'm, I'm not sure if that's intended to be repeated, because it, it may have been from somebody else. I, I don't know. I just wanted to check whether it was appropriate that that paragraph was repeated in the minutes. Um, and the second thing is that I think the numbering on page 11, um, so below that paragraph I drew your attention to, we've got paragraphs 9, 10, and 11, but I, I'm not sure that numbering, I think that numbering continues from the numbering on page 10. I, I'm not sure if it's appropriate that that numbering should be there. Yeah, I think that. And I, think, I just wanted to check whether that's all as it should be. I'm not quite sure what it should be if it's not that, but. I think we'll ask for that to be. <laughs> we just ask for it to be. We'll clarified. ask for that to be looked at and for the question of whether that one of those paragraphs should be uh, removed or the answer which is on the re for the response on page 12 should be combined with that on page 11. But thank you for spotting that. Eagle-eyed. <laughs> now, I presume that page t pages 12 and 13 are then okay. No problem. Subject to those, uh, is everyone content that we approve the minutes? Thank you very much indeed. So, we now move on to item five on the agenda which is public questions, but I can confirm that no questions have been received by the deadline. Uh, the next item on the agenda is item six, and this relates to the proposal for civil parking enforcement in South Cambridgeshire, and I will invite Councillor Neil Goff to introduce this item. Neil, over to you. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, so Firstly, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the work of the officers on this, and um, we've got Gareth Bell on the, uh, the call with us uh, this evening. Um, he's been very much involved in the preparation of this uh, paper, which I think is, is very clear and uh, very concise and very welcome. Um, and uh, a number of officers have been involved in this before. Uh, in fact, this, this have, has a very long history, this, this particular subject matter. In fact, I was looking back in my email and the first meeting I was involved in on civil parking enforcement was back in July 2018 um, with uh, Peter Fain, who I think is also in the chamber. Um, we, were, we were talking to officers there um, in the context of uh, issues raised uh, in our villages. Um, what, we, what we have um, this evening before you is um, is a, a, a really a step in the process of a of an actionable um, plan to introduce civil parking enforcement in South Cambridgeshire, um, which has been enabled by partnership working with the Greater Cambridge Partnership and the County County uh, the County Council. Um, Greater Cambridge Partnership is critical in this uh, because they have agreed to fund the initial setup costs and any deficit over the first five years. You will see in the table uh, there is an anticipated deficit which the GCP will, will fund and therefore there will be no, no costs um, associated with the setup or, or that uh, period for, for South Cam's District Council. Um, that, that is critical because those of you who Remember, there's statutory guidance around um, civil parking enforcement, uh, which makes it very difficult for South Cams uh, to introduce civil parking enforcement as we don't actually have a stream of parking revenues 
uh, to fund any deficit. So the GCP has uh, really enabled us here to, to unlock uh, this opportunity. The Greater Cambridge Partnership supports civil parking enforcement because it will reduce illegal and inconsiderate parking in our area and thereby uh, improve um, the flow of uh, the flow of traffic and reduce uh, congestion. I also think that this will be very welcome uh, in our in our parishes. I know a number of parishes have expressed uh, to to us in local uh, in parish council liaison meetings their frustration around the lack of enforcement on parking, which has caused significant problems in a in a number of a number of villages. So I think this would also be very very welcome indeed. The one thing I should um, note is that that this is a, a step in the process. Um, what we're being uh, you're looking at today is, a, is an item which is going to come to cabinet su to support an application by the county council to the department for transport to introduce civil parking enforcement in South Cambridgeshire. Um, that is a step in a process, an important step in the process, uh, but a process which is really quite long and has a number of steps uh, in it, uh, including in the involvement of the Secretary of State uh, for transport before this can be implemented. So this is not a, a short term uh, implementation. This is a, it's a part of a, of a long process, but I think it will be welcome uh, that we're underway in this. And um, I will close my comments there and take any questions. So thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Goff. I am aware that there are a number of questions coming. So members, over to you. Councillor Claire Daunton, please. Thank you, um, and uh, thank you to Councillor Goff for setting us right on the history of, of, of all of this. Um, I really welcome this, um, and I think it will be particularly welcome for high schools, where um, it's one of the areas right across the district, I would suggest, where the parking problems, perennial parking problems. My question really uh, concerns the scrutiny of, of this, and there are three organizations involved, three institutions involved, and whether when we're setting up the whole process that scrutiny could be taken into account, where the scrutiny lies and how that will operate. Councillor Goff, did you wish to respond to that? I think it, the question really is, with the, within the three organizations, where does the management control lie? Yes, yeah, so well, I think, you know, I'm, I'm, um, I think that the sort of core body which is responsible is the county council, which is uh, which is actually applying, which is making the application. So I, I, I think they will sort of spearhead um, the, the process of um, uh, this this application uh, and, and are accountable for for that. Um, I think there's very much the the spirit with which this has been prepared. Uh, to date has been that there has been a lot of cooperation and dialogue between South Cam's District Council and the Greater Cambridge Partnership and the County Council. And I would hope that uh, and, and anticipate that that would uh, continue. So uh, we would be certainly involved on an ongoing basis in, uh, in, in the development and implementation of this. Thank you very much. Uh, we have Councillor Cohen and then Councillor Richard Williams. Thank you. Councillor Coe. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, mine was just a quick question on page 17, um, paragraph 15, um, where it talks about sort of um, enforcement um, being reduced or increased potentially, I suppose, depending on um, like the need for that enforcement. I was just wondering how that would be measured and how that would be decided across the, the sort of um, organisations? Is it that, you know, we would see um, reduced penalty notices or, you know, reduced resident complaints or um, it, that they might move enforcement officers to, to other areas? Okay, I think that's a, you know, that's a, a good question. I think it, it really will be reflective of what the experience of the scheme is. And I think in, in an ideal world, what, will, what would happen is that we would have one year of enforcement and then everyone in South Camps would obey uh, the, uh, the, the parking 
uh, uh, restrictions. And arguably at that point, there's no revenues, uh, there's no problem, and there would be every reason to expect that we could scale back the level of enforcement. So I think this is about um, sort of recognizing that, that as we get experience of, of what the effectiveness is and the effects of uh, enforcement officers, uh, we, we may um, kind of modify uh, the degree of activity uh, up or down um, according to uh, to the need. So this is, I think, a recognition that we're not really precisely in the period at the moment where we know exactly how the uh, the public is going to respond to this. Uh, and, and, you know, you will see in paragraph 14 recognition, reference to the fact that, you know, there is experience that the level of penalty notice is an area remains stable despite enforcement. You know, that, I think that's a, that's an assertion uh, that will be tested when the scheme is introduced. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Richard Williams. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Obviously, I'm re really pleased to see this and, and really pleased to see it smooth um, quite quickly over the last um, year or, or, or 18 months. Um, again, I w welcome the support of the GCP. I know that they've been um, pledging support for this for a while. And, and, and as I say, it's really good to see us taking this up. Um, residents will obviously be, be, you know, really pleased about this. I think for many people it can't come quickly enough. Certainly people on Station Road in Whittlesford, and I know many other members have got similar pl uh, places um, with real problems. There are a couple of questions I just wanted to ask. Um, firstly, about how the scheme, or whether the scheme will be run essentially as one service that will cover the city and South Cams, and I, I think East Cams is involved as well, or Huntingdon. I know one of the other districts is involved. Um, so will it be run as one scheme, or will it be run as three separate schemes? Um, I think that will be very, you know, important to the way it develops after that, that year. We, we kind of see um, the level of enforcement um, that we need. One other point, I was also really pleased to see uh, paragraph 21, that there'll be a reporting route um, so concerns um, about illegal parking can be made. I was just wondering if we yet know what the details of that would be and how that would work. Would it be something like, you know, the, the reporting of uh, traffic faults on the county council website, something that's that's open to the public? Um, and then just a tiny point, which is not a substantive point, but I think there's a typo in paragraph 19, uh, which says SCDC's initiated conversations with the GP and CCC about CP and its and has already stated. I think, I think the apostrophe S shouldn't be there. It would make more sense. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Members, are there any more questions? Um, right. We have, oh, sorry, we have Councillor Cathcart online. Okay, I'll come to you in a moment. Councillor Cathcart. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Just quickly, I mean, this, uh, again, I think this has been welcomed. Um, uh, th this, there are two aspects to it. There's the enforcement side, where people park on double yellow lines or single or whatever, and then there's a much more um, a vaguer one, which is the uh, inconsiderate parking, um, uh, where people park in areas which cause inconvenience to other people. It's this inconsiderate parking which uh, could actually take an awful lot of time. It is a problem in our villages. I just wonder whether you know, how we will actually look at that, whether we, <laughs> how we cope with actually identifying areas of inconsiderate parking, or whether we concentrate on purely the um, enforcement of areas where uh, the, the transgression is actually quite clear. I mean, I often get complaints about people who park in my village and they go along and have a look and I can, can't see any uh, mandatory um, objection, but I agree it's inconsiderate. So I'm just wondering, how this will be managed. Thank you. Councillor Goff. Okay, so um, I'll, let me just address Councillor Williams's uh, questions first. So, so firstly, on the nine, for the point on 19 on the typo, absolutely, we'll, we, will, we will correct that. Thank you very much. Um, in terms of the introduction, um, this is being introduced in parallel in Huntingdon and Fendland as well. Uh, so we are we are sort of piggybacking all three areas. Um, they will all, I believe, and I'm looking to Gareth here to confirm this, but certainly the South Camden one will be utilising the back office of the county council. 
And, and this is important because when you actually think about civil parking enforcement, there's quite a lot of very important process associated with it um, in terms of managing appeals um, and sort of, uh, you know, collecting collecting the, uh, the, the fight and so forth. So it's not an inconsiderable amount of process and it obviously makes a huge amount of sense to uh, uh, integrate those. Um, but I think my um, expectation is that uh, be, this will be sort of seen and reported on separately for South CAMS rather than being sort of amalgamated with the other areas. And, and, in, and that is implicit in the discussion we've just had about how we would um, run the activity on enforcement uh, agents. It would, be, uh, it would be specifically tailored to uh, the needs of South Cambridgeshire and the funding would be uh, specific to South Cambridgeshire as well. Um, sorry, Councillor Williams, I've forgotten what your second question was. <laughs> Thank you. The other second question was about the reporting yeah. um, and how, how the reporting will work. Uh, paragraph 21 talks about the scheme will also include a reporting route so concerns about illegal parking can be made. I ask whether that will be a public reporting route or uh, akin to the traffic reporting system in the county. Um, I don't know whether any specifics of that have been actually outlined. Uh, Gareth, do you, know, do you know any kind of details on that? Yeah, I, I can come in on that and, and can help on Councillor Cathcart's question as well, if it's helpful, Councillor Goff. So on, on reporting, um, there's still a final decision for the South Cam scheme, but uh, at the moment it's assumed that it will be the same uh, reporting mechanism it is for the scheme that the County Council run in the city, which is open to the public. Um, it's a really simple, it's feedback via, uh, via email because the kind of feedback that you're giving is slightly different because in most cases, um, if we're, if we're frank, someone who's parked illegally perhaps has moved on by the time, you know, someone can kind of get out there. So it's about establishing themes. Um, so it will be a simple mechanism open to all. Um, uh, Councillor Goff, I don't know if you want me to carry on to just talk about incons inconsiderate parking yeah. alongside. Yeah. So, yeah. uh, Councillor Cathcart, in regard to inconsiderate parking, um, we've included in the report here uh, the process that we're looking to try and put in place with the County Council. It's very early in the conversation around uh, some form of notice or letter for people who are parked inconsiderately rather than someone where a ticket can be issued. Um, it is an early stage and, and there's more work to do there, but it is, it is uh, foreseen that that will be activity that will take place alongside the enforcement activity. So if someone's out doing enforcement and they see someone parked inconsiderately, they can take the action. Um, but the scheme wouldn't be set up to be able to resource just going out to areas to look at inconsiderate parking. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you very much. Councillor Bratton. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to, um, I'm very glad to see this coming through. Uh, particularly from a village which is concerned about um, displacement parking in future. So I'm very pleased to see that. But I just wanted to check, um, clearly um, civil parking works in areas of density. And I just wanted to check whether we think it's going to work uh, in more rural dispersed areas. Uh, and I think other members have, have, might be concerned about that too. Councillor Goff. Well, I think it's certainly the the intent here is that uh, this uh, initiative covers the whole of South Cambridgeshire. It's not uh, it's not for just for villages which would be considered to be those which are most densely populated. I I think um, the effectiveness in dealing with any problems in more rural villages I think is is to be tested, um, but. Uh, I guess my, my hope and expectation is that in those areas, a little bit of enforcement might go a long way and might uh, resolve the problem very quickly. Thank you very much. Councillor McDonnell and then Councillor Carr. Okay. Councillor McDonnell. Peter. Hello. Thank, uh, thanks, Chair. Maybe a couple of um, response items. As I said, I declared an interest as uh, Chair of Highway, so not responding as such. Uh, from the cabinet, um, but just a bit of additional information. So 
there will be an enhanced uh, reporting tool available in uh, within six months in the county council um obviously the civil parking enforcement um is a bit further out than that but it will give residents the opportunity to report the expectation is from the county that the parish councils themselves will be able to guide uh, enforcement officers it will be light touch uh, on request and just to reaffirm what councillor goff said it, it will cover the entire district so even a small village relatively small village if it has a problem and wants the enforcement team to respond then they will respond that's very helpful thank you very much councillor martin khan uh, some of the points have been carried already by uh, dealt with by in response to councillor bradham's and councillor Don's question uh, uh, comments uh, but I, I'm, I'm very much in favour of this. I think it's very much needed. We have a particular problem in one of, a part of my ward in Orchard Park, which is effectively a, an extension of the city of Cambridge, but is in South Cambridgeshire, and you have one side, you've got civil enforcement uh, boundary, the other side you haven't. Um, but what I am concerned is the, is the uh, resources, and uh, um, you, you have two enforcement officers dealing with a, over 100 villages. Uh, and it's uh, you've talked about therefore it being a, a, a response to complaints but um, part of the effectiveness of um, of enforcement is the fact that you know that somebody's going to turn up uh, and um, uh, 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 and regular visits seem to me an important element I, I'm just wondering whether two enforcement officers to cover such a large area will be adequate um, and maybe that we haven't got the resources maybe that's the reason but but I do I do I, I am concerned you're doing uh, other rural areas uh, you, you mentioned, um, and the, I would be interesting to know whether you've actually got other rural areas similar to this in the county, which have already got enforcement and, and how that has worked and what resources you need for that. How have you come up across that requirement as your your, your determining that requirement? Thank you, Councillor Goff. Yes, I think you know. I think to to agents uh, across the whole district is obviously a thin geographic spread but we have to recognize that you know where we are at the moment the the, the level of enforcement we have in the, the district is 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 very very limited indeed um in fact i can't quite remember the statistic but i think it was you know when we started this conversation i think the the, the, the number of parking violations which were tickets were issued in it I think it was 1819 I think across the whole year was 21 um, which was just illustrative of where it sits on the priorities at the moment of the of the police so so whether two will solve the problem completely I very much doubt uh, it will not eliminate the problem of of uh, inconsiderate parking but it will certainly improve it quite significantly because it is two more than we have at the moment. And as we've uh, discussed previously, um, you know, this is not set in stone. Um, this is a, a scheme which once introduced can be can be optified and, and modified. Thank you very much. Are there any more questions, Councillor? No. Um, thank you very much indeed. We are invited to take note of this it will be going to cabinet i believe on the 9th of february um, is everyone content that we should recommend this uh, to go forward subject to the comments that have been made um, which we will forward to cabinet for their consideration in due course agreed thank you all very much indeed thank you gareth and thank you neil uh, for your contributions so we now come to item seven on the agenda which is the uh, very complex and very detailed 2025 business plan that we have in front of us. So I'm going to hand back to Councillor Neil Goff and ask him to introduce the report. Councillor Goff. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, ag again, first of all, I'd just like to, to note the contribution of the officers um, to this report and many of the head service are on the, on the call this evening. I think the report is, is really very concise. It's very comprehensive. Um, it's, a, it's a very good document. Um, I'm not going to hold up the meeting for too much uh, time, 
uh, by way of uh, introducing this report. That there were there were just a few points I wanted to to, to highlight. Um, first of all, this is uh, you know another another year uh, in what was a a business plan which covered um, period from 2019 through to 2024, so a five year plan. And as one would expect, therefore, uh, it's a plan where the basic key priorities remain unchanged. And there's a tremendous amount of continuity uh, in the objective for this year uh, compared to last year and the year before, because it's all part of one integrated plan. The second point I'd like to make is that, that there is, we've really tried to introduce a real focus on delivery uh, in this plan. Um, and indeed, in many ways, the most important aspect <laughs> document is not the things which we are going to deliver, but is actually the things which have been delivered. Uh, and the recognition that many of those have been delivered in very difficult circumstances uh, in the last couple of years. And indeed, some of them have actually been overachieved. Well. And I think we should acknowledge that this is, in many ways, um, uh, a report which, which um, Kind of formalizes the, the, the success of, uh, and, and the, uh, the, the efforts of our uh, officers in delivering um, the, the plan. Um, the third point I'd, I'd make is that, that obviously there is, uh, has been in the last few years, a, a, a real impact in the way in which this council has been asked to um, uh, deliver with respect to the impact of COVID. And we took last year an explicit decision to upscale the level of efforts which we have in terms of supporting our businesses and our communities. And I'm pleased to say that that focus continues within this plan too. It's a very important element of what we have to do uh, in the next 12 months is continue to support our communities and our businesses in their um, recovery from COVID. Um, the last point I would I would make is that um, this document obviously has to be read in conjunction with the budget um, because everything we deliver in here has to be funded and resourced. Um, it is funded and resourced, what's what you see before you. Um, and obviously, over time, as we uh, modify or, or update uh, the budget and the business plan, we will do so uh, as we progress towards uh, the council in February 22, when you will see the um, this, this document coming back for um, final approval. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, and thank you for letting us have sight of this. It is a, an extremely complex document, but I know that there are a number of questions from members, so who, Councillor Bradman, you're going to kick us off, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, so just one nitpicking typo, uh, folks, and that is, um, amongst some other things, on page 30 of our agenda pack, um, under ongoing objectives into 2022-23, uh, I th the, wor the wording says, encourage local people to use their shops and food outlets. And I think what that meant to say was encourage people to use their local shops and food outlets. Um, just an observation, because the whole point of it was to try and get people to use their local high streets more than elsewhere. Um, the uh, second item I wanted to raise was about trees. This is on our page 35. And, you know, absolutely brilliant that the South Cams has been making it possible for parishes to plant trees. But I just, and in, you know, we had three free trees last year and six free trees this year. Um, so it's in the C2 um, target of being green to our core, right at the bottom deliver six free trees. I just wanted to alert South Cams, I'm sure you are aware, that not only are we encouraging parishes to plant more trees, but um, 
Charities such as the Woodland Trust are also doing that. And indeed, the county has a, a concern in this regard. And I just wanted to remind you, um, as I'm sure you are aware, that actually parish councils own relatively little land. And parish council land is often a recreation ground or a sports pitch. And so we need to be mindful that, by all means, yes, invite them, but actually parishes may, there may come a limit to the number of trees that parishes can plant because of lack of space. So um, I just wanted to be alert to that. Um, and I wondered whether we at South Cams might consider making this offer available to private landowners um, who might be the bigger owners of land uh, in our parishes. I'm not saying we should, I'm just saying, can we consider that? And I, there might be all sorts of things, reasons not to do that, but if we could just bear that in mind. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we'll did you wish to respond to that, Councillor Gough? Yes, I, I, I think the only thing I would say is that, that, that actually the response by the parish councillors has been pretty extraordinary. Um, and, and actually, if you look on page 39, you'll see that uh, for 2022 for the six free trees, that's 72 applications were received from parish councillors. So, you know, despite, as you say, Councillor Bradman, the limited land and so forth, that it does appear that this has been both been well received and the parishes have actually risen to the challenge, um, which is uh, which is very gratifying. So if, if we were seeing low take up of the scheme, I think we would reconsider, but it looks like it's uh, hitting the spot. Thank you very much. Well, I have a cue, but I can see that Councillor Smith is quite keen to speak now, I think. Okay. Uh, thank you. Just so for, for clarification for Councillor Bradnam, um, the three or six free tree schemes are not exclusively for parish councils, nor exclusively for parish council land. So in my own village of Gamlingay, it was a community group who uh, have applied to, um, I think we gave them, a, actually that might have been through zero carbons, but they've part in mini forests, but it's not exclusively for parish councils. And, you know, there is other sort of community land as well available. And I think we offer considerable help to uh, villagers who are keen to plant trees, but are struggling to find the land. So I think, you know, we do, we do help them do that. Thank you. Very good. Thank you for that. Uh, all right, Chair, so we have Councillor Daunton. Uh, did, did I see Councillor Fain's hand as well? Yes, so it's Councillor Daunton or Fain. Claire, over to you. Thank you, um, uh, thank you very much. There's a, there's a lot of good stuff here. I've got a couple of um, questions. Um, and they're both in relation to housing, which is on page 32. Um, on the liaison meetings, will there be capacity to introduce other liaison meetings with, in areas where there are new developments? That's my first question. And my second one is I don't actually see here or under um, communities the introduction or the establishment of the new housing engagement board. So should that be listed here? Councillor Gough. Okay, so so in terms of the liaison meetings, my my sort of response to um, Councillor Daunton is that that certainly I think we we would consider um, additional meetings. Um, it is an area which is quite resource intensive on officers to um, sort of manage the the meetings. But it does appear to me that there have been some really good feedback from these liaison meetings. And so certainly where there are multiple developments uh, in other areas, we would certainly, I think, consider that. So sort of open to suggestions if that uh, were any specific for that. Um, in terms of the, the housing question, I think I'm going to uh, ask uh, sort of Peter Campbell whether he would give us an update on where that is and whether it uh, should be introduced if, uh, if I may pass that over to Peter. Yeah, by all means. Peter, welcome. I am members. Yeah, um, Peter Campbell had a housing. Uh, yeah, thank you, Councillor Daunton. The, uh, as you know, the Housing Engagement Board ha was introduced uh, last year, and I, I think you're suggesting that we note that uh, as a achievement for the previous year. Uh, and if um, Councillor Goff is agreeable to that, I can see no issue in doing that. 
Thank you very much indeed. And if I might just add to um, a comment in relation to those liaison meetings, um, I would say that the one in Hardwick that I attend has gone down extremely well and it's enabled a two-way dialogue between parish council and the district council and I would strongly support um, the extension of them if we can uh, arrange it within the available time. So, next. Yes, Councillor Fain. Councillor Peter Fain. Peter. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I very much welcome this report. Very well put together. Um, the, my question really relates to the four key priorities on page 25, which we've long agreed. Um, inevitably, however, the, the context for that changes and therefore perhaps the prioritization and the um, emphasis. Um, I, I, I think that in particular, following COP26 and the, the move to net zero, um, we have to look not only at being green to our core, but I would suggest that building homes that are truly affordable has to take greater account of the, the costs of heating those homes with a, a very sudden uh, increase in uh, energy costs and therefore for many fuel poverty um, in prospect. Uh, looking at page um, 31, uh, I think it's perhaps we should be helping businesses to understand at the top of that page there the, the benefits not only of generating their energy, own energy but also of energy efficiency um, as well as the wider post COP26 initiatives. Um, and in looking at page 32 B4, improving the energy efficiency of existing council housing, that will, of course, include the challenge of replacing many of the heating systems. Um, gas boilers will become hard, well, will not be installed in new houses after 2025, of course. And I, I wonder whether we should take account of the council's responsibility uh, for <coughs> enforcement of the energy efficiency standards for the private rented sector as a whole, and not just look, be looking at existing council housing in that respect, perhaps that comes elsewhere. And if I could just join in the typo bingo, as though these typos had not already been picked up by officers, I think I'm the first to paragraph 18 on page 23. I don't think we're committing to be an employee of choice um, for people with disabilities, but I may, I may, that may be just my grammar. No, I think you're right. Thank you very much. Um, yep. Councillor Goff, or yeah, that, come back so, on that. I, I, I think Councillor Fain, you make some very good, very good points in, as well. And you know, I, I think in terms of um, the increased em emphasis on the issues of uh, the environment and particularly uh, energy and uh, efficiency, I, I, I absolutely agree. I, I think when we when we come to uh, that priority area about truly affordable housing, it was very much always our intent that that was a broad concept of affordability uh, to include both um, the uh, cost to residents of affordable homes of, uh, for example, getting to work or getting to school in terms of their accessibility to accessible transportation, um, and, and also the efficiency and energy efficiency of their, of their homes. Um, but you are, you are right, I think, and we perhaps uh, will take this back and consider it as to whether we need to um, reinforce that, uh, that point about uh, energy costs, particularly against the context of what is happening to unit energy prices in this country, which is obviously um, really, really significant. So I, I welcome those comments, and I think as cabinet we'll uh, think about that and take those on board. Um, Thank you very much. Is there any others? Yeah, we currently have three more requests to speak from councillors Cohn, Cathcart, and Richard Williams. Okay. Councillor Graham Cohn. 
Uh, thank you, Chair. Mine's just a, a quick one. On page 35, um, where we talk about the investment, um, uh, investing in, in green energy, uh, I just wondered if that could be sort of bulked out at all by talking about electric charging points at all across um, uh, South Cams and, and how we're sort of you know, looking at implementing those both on our own land and maybe in conjunction with the sort of private sector. Um, it's probably referred to in, in the other reports that this sort of links to, so I, I can set that in the case. Uh, and the only other thing was on the um, uh, fly tipping uh, measures, which I mentioned on page 38. I know that the council has already taken uh, measures about um, uh, like uh, skilling uh, refuge collectors and, and other um, sort of uh, maintenance staff to sort of report fly tipping and I just wondered if that should be something that's included within the um, in, in the statement there and that's all thank you very much councillor golf yes um you know, again no, thanks for those those comments good, good comments I think certainly um if we can I'm, I'm, very, I'm a great fan of making these uh objectives if we can a little bit more quantitative and a little bit more uh, tangible so uh, we will have a look at whether there's anything we can do with respect to that on electric vehicle charging points um i guess councillor Cohen, i guess what you're you're headed towards is can we put a number there um we'll see what we can do uh in, in to at least in that direction of travel um and, and on fly tipping you know i think Again, this is this is an area which has been a a sort of focus in, in, in the sort of processes where we are using our crews to identify fly tips and um, sort of quickly clear them. Uh, has I know I know from my experience in my ward been been successful and there's been recognition of that amongst the residents. Uh, again, we'll have a look and see whether we can. I'm looking at Boda here to see whether he's he's nodding or shaking his head. Um, again, as to whether we might be able to to sort of put some measures uh, to uh, to indicate the success we've uh, we've had and what we might be uh, uh, aiming to do in the future. But I think both both good good points which we'll take on board. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's very helpful. Councillor Cathcart. Councillor Nigel Cathcart. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, no, just uh, just what we get. The thing about I, I mean I I agree with almost everything in these documents, um, uh, and I think they are they they they're all to the good. Um, uh, the problem about having priorities and objectives is that so if it's if it's not as a priority or objective, sometimes it tends to get almost totally overlooked um, uh, or diminished significantly. I mean, one thing that has been diminished over the years um, is our the attention we pay to conservation areas and the quality of our traditional high streets and uh, and the preservation enhancement of our listed buildings and restoring lost architectural detail. Um, now, this was a considerable effort by the council many years ago, um, and I can't see it there anywhere. It could be argued, of course, that this is just one document amongst many which the council consider, um, and I'm not quite sure where to put it, frankly. <laughs> Because there doesn't seem to be an obvious place for it, but I'd just like to make the point that um, uh, uh, the, the 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 quality of our quality of our high streets and conservation areas is of importance to all our residents because it adds to the quality of life for everyone who lives in our existing villages, um, uh, and it's something I think that you know it would be nice, uh, satisfactory if it could be considered somewhere within these documents. But as I say, I've looked and looked in vain where, where it could be put, but perhaps it might, there might be a place for it somewhere. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Goff, did you wish to say anything? Yes, I'm, I'm sort of... Um, I'm sure it's in here somewhere. Yeah, but, uh, just sort of Liz, we, we did, we did um, the, uh, sort of in recognition of what, you know, we talk about the sort of quality of our high streets and the villages and so forth. I know one aspect which we have continually um, uh, kind of recognised is, is an issue is is the 
the existence of some buildings which are sort of problematic in terms of deterioration. And I, and I, I thought that that was somewhere in our list of priorities here, but I am struggling in vain as well to find it. Liz, did, did, that, did that actually so, make it into the document? If I may chair through you, um, we have uh, got a group um, set up to, to consider some of those issues, including things like buildings at risk and so on. Um, I don't think it's addressed in the business plan. Um, it's more under kind of planning and planning policy discussions um, and reports and, and so on. But we, we could potentially have a look at picking it up in this document if, if members would like us to. Thank you very much. I think that would be helpful. Yes, I, 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 thank you, Liz. I, I know it's a sort of just one aspect of what Councillor Cathcart was talking about, but I'm sort of aware that it is a sort of initiative which is being taken, which kind of represents a, a kind of greater focus than there's been in the past. So we will, we will see if we can incorporate that into the document. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Cathcart. We have Richard Williams. Uh, Councillor Richard Williams. Sorry. Uh, th thank you very much, Chair. I, I've just got two points. First point, in, in defence of um, Councillor Bradnam, um, I, I have to say that similar issues have come up in, in my parish councils about exactly where they put the free trees. I, I was very pleased to hear what the, the leader suggested about the, the trees being able to be planted elsewhere, but that's not actually what the scheme says. On, on our website, it says the council offered every parish council in the district six free trees in exchange for an undertaking to plant the trees on parish council land. So that's on our website right now, and that's how my parish is understood um, that scheme. So if we could look at changing the criteria for the upcoming scheme, I think that would be very good because parish councils don't, um, as Councillor Bradham has said, have, have, that, have that much land, then in order for the scheme to carry on, um, I think we should um, make those criteria more flexible because, as I say, that's what it says on our website uh, right now. Uh, my second point uh, was on page 37, um, C10, our objective to uh, reduce the amount of non-recyclable household waste collected. I, I think that that's an excellent um, objective um, to set ourselves. I was wondering if, if uh, Councillor Goff could ju just clarify that the figures mentioned in the second column are the targets. So when it talks about monthly averages of 17.08 kilograms, I think it means that they are the targets we're, we're aiming to achieve, not um, what we've discovered in, in, in the quarter three analysis. Um, and, and I was wondering if I could just ask for a little bit more detail as to how we're going to, to do that. I think it is something we should do. In some ways, it could be done very simply. I think if we just gave every household a very easily easy to read uh, an easy to understand leaflet saying this is what goes in each bin uh, that, that, that would actually go, go a long way um because i don't think we've done that for a while but the other key area i just value a little bit more information on is recycling of food waste i know a lot of districts have the little food bin uh, that, that we don't and i think that that's a particular area where, where we really could maybe do something to um to help residents do what they want to do um uh, and, and, and achieve the targets we're after. Yeah. So, so off. yeah, that's 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 good. Um, again, good good comment. So, so I'm, I'm going to ask, uh, with your permission, um, Chair Borde, to talk about some of the details of this. But um, I, again, this is an area where uh, I'm very pleased that we we do actually have some measurable targets associated with um, the, uh, the, the, the waste, um, because it is also, it, it's, it's not just about increasing the proportion of waste which is recycled, which is what often one sees council supporting, but it's also about reducing the total amount of uh, material which is collected. And that is what these measures are trying to um, achieve. Um, I, I believe these are measures which are uh, reported quite uh, regularly. Um, it is quite it is quite complicated, and the county council I think has done um, a piece of work quite recently at uh, investigating the composition 
of um, certainly black bin waste because one of the real problems is things ending up in the black bin uh, which shouldn't be there um, and which cause uh, cause the the total amount of landfills therefore to be uh, unnecessarily high. Um, so this is a you know a real area of focus. I, I I think your point about food waste as well is is very real and you'll be aware of the trials which are taking place in that. Um, in, in, in some areas of our, our district at the moment on separate collection of food waste. But, but let me ask Bordet to pick up here and um, see whether there is uh, any additional detail he wishes to add in terms of what the plan is for this coming year. So with your Thank you very much, Councillor Goff. There's really not much to add. Your answer has been quite uh, comprehensive. I think just to also say that uh, the data that we gather is measured across various parts of the chain. So in terms of uh, collections, in terms of the recycling plants and what goes for disposal. And we have to report on this as well to DEFRA. So there are various stages where we collect the data and there are also various stages where the data is verified and audited. These numbers are targets that uh, we, we, we plan to achieve. So they're targets that we have set ourselves. Um, in terms of uh, food waste, we do have a food waste trial that's going on. And there are quite a few parishes across the two council areas, the shared waste services, that we collect food waste from. And we're learning what are the best uh, methods. It's not um, in terms of uh, the way we collect the food waste, the kind of vans that we use, with the tension that when we receive very soon, hopefully, some uh, mandatory guidance from the government, which is long overdue, and then we will be able to hopefully roll out food waste to the rest of the council areas. At the moment, it's not mandatory. We need to budget for that. It's quite, it's going to be quite a big expense, but we are conducting trials which are giving us very good results and we're learning from so that when the time comes, we'll be ready to hopefully roll that out across the entire council area. Thank, sure. you, thank you both very much. Sorry. Chair, Chair, could I just come back because, um, with your permission? So, so sorry, we before I answered the question, the, the answer to um, Councillor Williams' question is those are the targets uh, for, for for this year, um, and I can play the game of uh, of um, spotting typos too as well. And it's it's actually the rate of rejection uh, of uh, recy from recycling materials, not ejection. Uh, yes. <laughs> is, uh, so so. So that is that is a measure trying to reduce effectively the contamination uh, of our uh, blue bin recycle material by foreign objects, which uh, which causes penalties and loss of value if we uh, if, if we exceed that six percent target. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor Martin Carl. Then I'm going to come to Councillor Bridget Smith. Martin. Um, yes, okay, a couple of things. Uh, there's two elements, really, that I wanted to co comment on. Um, really, it's the, we, the council has not been active uh, for many years on cultural issues. Uh, and we're now starting to look at the possibility of what, how one might tackle that. In term, we'll be meeting a couple of days on a, looking at how we might look at a cultural strategy. I think, I was trying to think where that would come in, but I think it ought to be included as the, as the sort of program. Whether I feel it probably comes in the modern and caring council, but there's also an element in the business side of it as well. So it, it, it straddles a bit. Um, uh, and so I feel that needs to be mentioned, even if it's just in the long term, the longer term um, uh, uh, objectives that we might be looking at in, uh, rather than an immediate action. Um, uh, and the, se the second point is the, um, the fact that uh, just in February 2020, uh, to, um, we passed an motion on uh, building on Europe, building our European links, which is um, not very cited. Um, uh, we, nothing has happened uh, because a couple of weeks later, the whole whole of our actions changed dramatically. Uh, and I'm not, I've not been pushing it. I don't think anybody else has been pushing it. But now we're moving out of, of, of the, COVID, the pandemic. I think we ought to think about how we might do something on this. It, a number, lots of villages have European links. Um, they are threatened. I, I would like to comment, the, I don't know if you've seen the recent comment in the press about the effect on school trips or, 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 um, since, since Brexit. 
uh, they basically collapse. Virtually none are taking place. So I'm saying like five or ten percent of what happened before, because European uh, schools are, are not don't wish to come to Britain because of the problems involved in, in doing so. Um, so if we're going to maintain our links, we, we need to think how to do that. It's important, I think. It's important, particularly for our communities, that these are maintained. There are lots of, quite a lot of number of communities who have already got links uh, set up, and certainly in lots of schools have. So I think something perhaps might be mentioned on that about as, a long, as our long term. Thank you. Councillor Gough. Yes, thank you. Councillor Khan. Um, yes, yeah, certainly the, the, the sort of cultural work stream, I think, which, uh, as you say, has been identified, I think we can certainly reflect that um, in, the, uh, in, the, in the document. I think it's, you know, this document basically is, a, is an evolution. I think that I see that as something which uh, is now um, kind of actively uh, under consideration. So I sort of rec recognise uh, we, we, we should probably uh, make reference to that in the report. I think in terms of the sort of European um, sort of connections, uh, again, I, I, I think it's it's certainly uh, uh, a very good uh, aspiration. I, I, I struggle a little bit to, 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 to find out how we would translate that to immediate actions, but, but I'm certainly happy to, um, for, for Cabinet to discuss that and think about it. And if, Councillor Khan's got any specific uh, actions or activities um, which you can foresee in the next year, sort of to, uh, to, to, to consider that in the uh, deliberations with Cabinet. So thank you very much for that contribution. Thank you very much. I'm now going to come to Councillor Bridget Smith, who I'm uh, sure will wish to add. Um, thank you. Uh, well, I just want to respond to Councillor uh, Richard Williams. So, um, Councillor Williams, um, you were partly right and I was partly right and I was partly partly wrong too. Um, so, it says under the terms and conditions on the website, uh, trees must be planted on uh, South Cambridge and Parish Council land except where no Parish Council owned land is suitable, in which case trees can be planted on land owned by a charity or on County Council land with written permission. And I know that I intervened in one case where the parish council was struggling. And actually our officers, as one would expect, took a pragmatic and flexible approach. Um, so that is in the terms and conditions, but you do have to click a link. So um, we will uh, very happy to take up your suggestion to make that, that clearer, because we certainly don't want people not applying for these grants um, just because they think we've got no land at all. So we'll make sure that's, uh, that's higher up on the, uh, the explanation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Bradnam, I think you are our final speaker on this topic. Chairman, thank you very much for letting me come back for a second strike at this. I just wanted to say very quickly, on our page 37, which is where we're looking at being green to our core, and we're looking at air quality monitoring, um, and the proposal on page 37, which talks about... Um, subject to air quality monitoring results, explore feasibility of creating a public space protection order, specifically targeting idling vehicles. Um, I just wanted to ensure that that would reflect the current Road Traffic Act, which, um, so for example, obviously we'd be totally um, supportive of dealing with this, for example, outside schools, or and ind indeed supporting Network Rails wish that this should be checked at level crossings where cars might idle and pollute the um, area around level crossings. But I just wanted to ensure that it would exclude, for example, things like people temporary, temporarily stationary because of traffic flow uh, or congestion um, or at, at um, light controlled you know, traffic lights, or indeed people, for example, simply de-icing their car on their own drive. I know there's an, ex that there's an exclusion for people doing maintenance, and I don't know whether de-icing your car is included in maintenance. I just wanted to be sure that, that that would be targeted where we see a real need. So, for example, outside schools and, and, and level crossings would be very sensible in my view. Um, the other thing was I just wanted to check whether there is any plan to do any monitoring on the A10 uh, or near our new um, development at Water Beach Newtown, where there's concern that the school is quite close to the A10. And I just wanted to be sure that we're, we might be considering putting 
air quality monitoring there. Thank you. Councillor Goff. So, um, Councillor uh, Bradman to answer uh, quite a detailed question, but I, I noticed that Bode was nodding furiously um, <laughs> as she was speaking uh, with respect to taking on board the sort of road traffic act. So. I, I assume from from his reaction that he is very aware of that and that will be incorporated into uh, the activities associated with that particular objective. In terms of the A10 monitoring, Councillor Bradman, we'll have to get back to you on that. I, I simply don't know whether that is part and parcel of the uh, of the objectives, but we'll, we'll in, unless anyone, uh, any officer on the call knows explicitly. But, I, I can address that as well, if that's okay, Councillor yeah. Goff. Just uh, two points, absolutely. Um, the intention is that if we do proceed with this protection order, the focus will be near schools. Those are the areas where we'll be targeting, not uh, individual homes. And in terms of uh, monitoring, we have uh, a few monitoring stations, portable stations, which are currently deployed. I think what I would say is if there are specific areas that uh, members think we should be uh, sampling, we should monitoring, please let us know specifics and then we can look into that. Thank you very much indeed. I, I have no more speakers on this, so um, we have made a number of comments, a number of suggestions, many of which have been taken up, and I thank Councillor Gott for that. Uh, the recommendation for us is on page 22, and we are invited to consider the proposed draft 2025 business plan at Appendix A with the action plan primarily focused on delivery 2022-23 and to make any recommendations for changes or additions to the plan, which we have done. Am I uh, right in believing that the meeting is minded to uh, approve this for onward transmission to Cabinet? Thank you very much indeed. An excellent document. Thank you for the hard work that's gone into it. Uh, we now come to agenda item eight, which is in the uh, separate package of documents that you received and that relates to the summary general fund revenue budget and I will in a moment invite Councillor John Williams to present that but I should just say to you um, that firstly thank you so much for the very detailed work that has gone into this. I find the fact that we have uh, separate sheets detailing the expenditure line by line extremely helpful uh, but I would just remind members that of course this is still very much an ongoing uh, document and there is still a quite a considerable amount of work, work going on so there are some missing numbers at this time uh, but they will come together in the next few days. So Councillor John Williams over to you. Thank you, Chair. Um, and as you say, um, this is work in progress. Um, so there are some figures that um, we are still waiting to put into the document. Um, and obviously there may, may well be some changes to the document as a result of those figures. So, um, uh, but can I also take the opportunity of uh, introducing this to thank the officers for, um, we, they've had a look at the way we presented these reports and I think they've come forward with an excellent, particularly the tables are so much clearer now and that uh, there is so much more detail, but despite that, it's set out so well that it's still very easy to, to, to use. So I'm very grateful to uh, the head of finance and his staff um, for the way they've produced, not just this one, but also the uh, housing revenue account uh, paper as well. Um, you, you'll see that um, if you look on page 32, the crux of the, so if you look on paragraph 32, the crux of, of, of all of this is that uh, when we look at uh, the spending baseline um, and we look at uh, what uh, uh, the difference between um, spending this this year and what we intend to spend next year, you'll see that it's just about 900,000 pounds increase in that 
uh, in, in that expenditure. You'll see in the document that the bids behind that are in the are in the appendices, together with the savings that uh, have been identified um, to enable us to continue to have a balanced budget, despite us increasing um, the services um, and the activities of this council in line with the business plan that we have um, just uh, discussed. Um, if you have any details about the figures, um, the Head of Finance would be happy to, um, to, to answer them, and obviously I'm happy to answer any questions of, of policy on this. Thank you. Thank you, the Councillor Williams. I, if I might start, we, um, we did, of course, have a look at this in a pre-meet last night, and one of the areas of um, concern was the reference to uh, the increase in the cost of pensions. And I did ask the Head of Finance to come back to us with some numbers, particularly in relation to the rate of contribution. Um, so perhaps I might invite Peter to um, just start off by uh, giving us those, that information, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I can confirm that the employer's contribution rate is 13.8%. Um, I just thought I'd pick out some highlights within the report and perhaps um, look at uh, a little bit of the detail in the new pages. Um, firstly, I, I'd like to apologise for the lateness of the report. Um, it's a bit of a trade-off between getting as much information into the report as possible and producing a report that has lots of figures missing. So we've tried to get that balance right as best we can, but I do appreciate some of the figures uh, are in fact still missing. Um, I will update the numbers that I can update as we go. Um, if I um, draw members' attention firstly to Appendix A, which is the budget summary on page 79. Gotcha. Now, um, I do think we need to do a little bit of work on the numbering because um, I didn't think it was entirely clear in hindsight how we'd numbered this up. And perhaps within Appendix A, it's probably helpful to refer to which of Appendix B um, each line relates to. So you'll see at the top of Appendix A, we have each of the service areas um, and those seven rows, if you like, there, refer back to the detailed budget packs. So I think it probably would make sense to put on that budget summary which number in Appendix B that relates to. Um, so you'll see um, right at the top of that, um, each of the service areas net expenditure. What I would say uh, is that um, Expenditure has generally increased next year, um, but as um, the chair mentioned earlier, a lot of this is related to pensions. Um, within the budget, we account for pensions in relation to the service cost rather than the employer's contributions, and that is a significantly higher figure than the employer's contributions. Having said that, you'll see in the second part of the table, there's a line, fourth line down under net cost of services, called depreciation reversals and other adjustments. There are two key um, expenditure items that we have to include within our net cost of services, which we then reverse out in order to come up with a figure that's to be met from government grants and local taxpayers. And those are depreciation, so the use of fixed assets has to be charged to the service in which it relates, but we cannot charge that against the council tax, so that has to be removed as part of that line I've just referred to. And the other item is the net cost of pensions. Um, 
which again features within each service area, but we then have to reverse that out again in the same way as we do depreciation. The net cost of pensions has gone up uh, somewhat in 20, or the estimated increase has gone up in 22-23. Um, related to the pandemic, I suspect, and a number of, uh, uh, in the way investments have performed. So you will see that the depreciation reversal and other adjustment figure is significantly higher than in the current year. So effectively what I'm saying, a lot of the increase shown in the net cost of service is then reversed out in that line. So the overall effect on the budget is broadly neutral. Yes. Peter, do you happen to know what the, the cost of that pension, what the total amount of that pension contribution is? Um, not off the top of my no. head, okay. but I can, I can find that out. Yeah, don't worry. Um, I did look at um, planning services in particular, and I, and I can confirm that the figure for 21-22 was 235,000, and in 22-23 is 955,000. So that, that demonstrates the magnitude of the increase, but as I said, we're then reversing that out. Yeah. And that accounts for why that is a significant element in why you know, the cost of planning has gone up. I understand. Okay. Um, if I uh, just talk a little bit about the budget packs. So um, there's some narrative uh, under budget formulation Uh, point C, paragraph 13 onwards. There's a little bit of narrative about the budget packs. So what I thought I would do is to have a quick look at the budget packs and try and explain what the figures are telling us within those packs. So you will see with each budget pack, there's a title page, and then we have a summary. So that summary is a little bit more detail behind each of the lines within Appendix A. So, for example, on Appendix A, under planning, we had net expenditure of 7 million and 41. And this summary page, the second page within the budget pack for planning, shows a little bit more detail behind that 7 million and 41 uh, thousand. Just below that, there is a separate analysis of that figure between the amounts that relate to our ongoing budgets that we're going to incur year on year and the amount of that which is one-off items. So again, that 7041 is split between those two items on that summary page. We then have a number of pages which give further detail and each page, again, so the, the, the second page uh, in, each, uh, in the next section is in a bit more detail behind the first line on the first page. And within each pack, there's a, a little bit of a, a narrative around what each budget is, some of the key changes. Um, and um, we've been consulting with heads of service around some of the wording there. Um, so there's a little bit more detail behind that and then finally at the end there's what we call the subjective analysis and this again is an analysis of the net expenditure but by type of expenditure so employee related premises related etc and the types of expenditure are those that are prescribed in one of our accounting um, practice codes called um, the service reporting code of practice and this is something that's standard across all local authorities to get a degree of consistency in reporting. So um, so we've got a pack for each each of the um, yeah. each of the areas. Um, do you want me to stop there and see if there's any questions on the budget packs or shall I continue? I think stop there for the moment. We might come back to you with questions of, of detail on it. I have to say, I think that the section that you've just referred to and the breakdown of the understanding of each line 
of the uh, budget summary, having this detail is extremely helpful. And I know it's a lot of work, but so thank you and the team for delivering it. Um, members, questions? Councillor Martin Khan. Councillor Martin Khan. It's only actually a, a typo, but uh, in the first uh, th section 32 that you referred to, you uh, have the columns of uh, uh, and I read that we've got £574 billion pounds, uh, in increased resources. I think the M should be removed from all the column headings. Otherwise, you'll... Thank what, you for that. What page is Councillor Khan referring to? Um, page, page number 8, section 32, uh, the table. Yes, thank you. It's just pounds. <laughs> Cheers. I'd love it if we did have that resource, but... <laughs> Indeed. It'll probably take a few more people to look after it, though. Thank you very much. Any, uh, Councillor Bradman. You'll know how good I am at uh, analysing uh, financial documents, and I would just like to... And I, I not. Uh, so I just want to thank... Uh, Peter Maddock, for the format of this report, which is um, more understandable than they have been in the past, clearer than they have been in the past, and with a lot more detail, which I can't pretend to understand all of it, but actually it, I do think that what this demonstrates is that this District Council is really taking a grip of its finances, and I really appreciate the work that you've done to do this. Uh, so even if it's skims over the top of my head to some degree. Um, it, uh, what we can see is that, the pe that this has been looked at very carefully and I very much appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I don't see any more hands going up. Is everyone content? So, okay, Chair. In which case, I'll continue to pick out a few more highlights. Um, if, you, um, if you turn in the report to paragraph 29, you'll see there's a table um, that summarises the provisional financial settlement. So this was issued just before Christmas. Um, we've, um, there was a consultation period that ended on the 13th of January, uh, and so far... I haven't seen any confirmation or otherwise that the provisional settlement has been agreed. Um, but you'll see there a comparison between the settlement for last year and the provisional settlement for this year. Uh, the business base, the business, I can't say it, <coughs> the baseline <laughs> um, has remained unchanged. The rural services grant uh, is continuing at the same level as last year. Um, there was some fear that this would be removed, but um, that's continuing. The lower tier services grant, which was a new grant that was introduced in 21-22 as a one-off grant, has in fact been continued for a further year, so that was something that we weren't necessarily expecting. We've also had a new uh, grant <coughs> introduced called a services grant, which doesn't sound very different from the line above, uh, but again, um, this is at 182,000. Uh, and it's been billed as a one-off allocation just for 22-23. The new homes bonus, um, we had a consultation on this during the spring, I think, um, which closed, uh, and um, we haven't really heard anything more on that. So this, what we actually got within the provisional settlement is new homes bonus based on the old formula. Um, however, they did suggest that there was going to be a further consultation on new homes bonus. So whether they didn't like the responses uh, that were originally received, I'm not sure. But um, there's going to be a further consultation on this. So it's a little bit unhelpful in that um, the future of new homes bonus is still rather up in the air uh, when a review had been uh, suggested at least two years ago. So we wait and see what, what happens there. And then council tax income, the figures quoted there are based on an increase in the council tax base of 1,078.2 and an increase in uh, the council tax of £5 per annum. 
which equates to 4.9%. Um, the settlement allows us to increase the council tax by 1.99% or £5, whichever is the higher. Um, we've already referred to um, paragraph 32, which shows the differences between uh, the previous year, 21-22 uh, and 22-23. And it's basically, it's comparing the figures in column A on appendix A, or A or column one, should we say, to column five. So the 946 difference is the total movement. Um, just to say that um, in relation to business rates, we don't yet have the figures. Um, the business rate preset has to be set by the 31st of January uh, and we are going through the process now of setting that. Um, there's a fairly lengthy government form that has to be completed in order to set that and as I say we're working through that and the figures will be available hopefully towards the end of this week or early next week. Um, but what I can say is that the, the baselines and our tariff have remained unchanged. Um, I have no more questions. Does, does anyone else, any other member, have a question that they'd like to raise? Marty. No, I, I'd simply like to reiterate what Councillor Bradden said about how helpful it was to have the explanations in the, um, in the way that it's laid out. Absolutely. I think that really, we all see, we really do were helped by that. I think with the questions that we asked during our pre meet yesterday and those we've, we've um, successfully had answered today, I think... Um, We've satisfied all the queries that all of us have had. Um, we are invited to take note of this prior to it going to Cabinet. Uh, is everyone content that we send it on its way? Thank you. Thank you all very much indeed. And thank you, Peter, and your team. Thank you. So we come now to item nine, which is the housing revenue account. Uh, and I will ask Councillor John Williams to introduce this as well, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd just like to um, draw attention to uh, paragraph 21 and the table on housing stock, which shows that we estimate that by the end, by the end of this financial year, we'll have, we will have increased our housing stock by some 70 uh, properties uh, this year. So we will have exceeded our target. Um, and. Um, congratulate the housing team for, for their efforts in, in, in doing that. Um, but otherwise, again, I would uh, commend um, the head of finance and his team for a very fine document and a, a document that's very uh, easy to read and well set out. Thank you very much. Members? Councillor Bradman. Thank you, Chair. I was actually going to ask for a comfort break, but since you've come to me, <laughs> I'll ask the question I was going to ask on this. Well, I, I simply wanted to um, thank the District Council for the delivery uh, of houses at Gibson Close in Water Beach, which we very much welcomed with its proportion of affordable housing. And uh, I also wanted to ask a question about self-build plots, which is on page 112 of the supplement. I have been some slightly concerned about the delivery of self-build plots and I'm, I think I'm reassured by paragraph 72 uh, where there's a recognition that there have been significant delays in concluding sales and um, that none of these um, plots have been sold in 2020. 21, 22, um, but I would also like us to be mindful of if these are to be sold as plots for self-building, to be mindful of who might be buying them. I know that sounds a bit bizarre, um, but to be sure that they are not actually going to major developers, that, that they are actually going for people to build on site for a house that they want to live in. 
Um, I say that because the plot referred to on page um, 113, uh, which is at Bennett Close in Milton, I think that one has been... Um, well, well, I'm not sure it's actually being lived in, going to be lived in by the person who developed it. And I just would like to be clear as to what our monitoring is of that and how we manage those. Thank you. Councillor Williams. Thank you. This is the sale of self build plots. Are we uh, certain that they're going to be um, they're going to be built by self builders as opposed to eventually ending up in the hands of major developers? I, I'm afraid that I will have to ask my housing colleagues and. Um, that, that I don't know, Peter can, Peter Campbell can answer yeah. that. I was going to say, Peter Campbell, Pat Campbell can probably answer that question, but I did want to uh, put on record um, the assistance from Peter and his team in writing the Housing Revenue Accounts Report, because quite, there's quite a lot of the information that's obviously come from there. Indeed, thank you. Peter? You have, you're happy to do that. Uh, of course, the proposal in paragraph 72 is saying that moving forward, we, disposal will not just be self-builders. Uh, that, that will be uh, made more widely uh, and I confirm that we um, uh, there is a, a, a legal agreement um, on the properties that have been sold uh, and if there are deviations from that uh, we will consider a profit action uh, against the purchaser uh, and if uh, Councillor Bradman wants to speak outside this meeting uh, for, for details I'm more than happy to do that. Thank you Peter. Councillor Nigel Cathcart. Nigel. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, just a question really on, on, on rent levels, on uh, paragraph 40. I just want some sort of clarification of that. Um, it, it seems to suggest that uh, social housing providers, of which we won't, could actually reset our rent levels at 80% of the um, uh, of market rent. Uh, but our policy is to set up substantially less than that. Um, I just want some sort of confirmation that, that that's my understanding of it, um, because there's a huge disparity between council rents and um, housing association rents, uh, and that disparity seems to be widening over time. And, and a number of us always felt that um, the uh, the by keeping council rents as low as sensible and practical, we do provide that sort of um, uh, that uh, the, 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 the ability to actually um, you know, make, make the rents truly affordable. Um, but I'm just wondering about whether there's, there's a long term trend away from that. I just wonder if Peter Campbell could, <laughs> could, um, could indicate us <laughs> where we are on that. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to do that. There are um, two separate uh, rent levels here, uh, and uh, sometimes the the, uh, the phrases are used interchangeably, but they refer to uh, to different things. So most uh, existing council houses uh, is set as a as, as a social rent. Uh, that is based on a a formula that's set by government, uh, and sometimes you'll hear it um, uh, referred to uh, referred to target rent. Uh, and that is the, uh, the the lower level, which I think that Councillor Cathcart uh, refers to. There is also the concept of uh, affordable rent, uh, and affordable rent is based on 80% of the market rent. Um, and some housing associations, uh, well, and, and the council um, uh, use that uh, when we're acquiring um, uh, new housing. So there are the two separate levels to, to, to look at. Uh, and of course, um, when those are both increased by, by inflation, uh, although they may go up by the same percentage, um, the, uh, the, uh, the, the pounds and pence, the financial difference, um, uh, does increase. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Yeah, that's really that's <laughs> <laughs> I would like to ask. Councillor Claire Daunton. Thank you. 
I have a question about um, the garages, um, which is on pages, uh, page 103, paragraphs 43 and 44. Um, I see that um, there is uh, probably a project to, to look at the uh, disused garages. And I think um, I'm, it's interested to see that the number of garages across the district, three, uh, approximately 347. Um, and I just wondered whether the project that's ongoing at the moment is, is will is likely to release more space for for homes for development for council houses um it's too early sorry i jumped it's in all right there. peter i was going to say i'm sorry. sure that's one for you yeah it's it's a bit too early to to judge that but it, that would be one of the aims of the project if a, a raise uh, is a possibility if, you, if there's more supply than demand uh, and that resulted in us uh, releasing some uh, some land for development. That would be an excellent outcome. But in a way that that's prejudging the uh, the work itself, we don't actually have the uh, um, the launch for that. The, the first meeting doesn't take place until this Thursday. Um, so what we'll do, we'll make sure that members are kept updated uh, with, with the progress of that. Thank you. That's helpful. Thank you. Oh, Steve. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Richard Williams. Sorry. Um, thank, thank you very much, Chair. Um, just, just a couple of points. Um, one, one is just a point, point of clarification, really, um, uh, and this may be me, but on page 105 of the agenda pack, so paragraphs 56, 57 through to 61, talks about the HRA revenue account budget for next year, 22-23. But it's all written in the past tense, which I found really confusing as to whether this was about the future budget or the past budget. Um, so, it, it, for example, it, it says the HRA budget at the start of the financial year, supposedly referring to 22-23, was just above 2.6 million. So, just a bit of clarification on that. It may, it may be me, maybe the way I'm reading it, but, but I was a bit confused by the past tense for future budget. Um, and... Um, so just to clarify, for example, that the income increase, paragraph 49, is 1.8 million that we're expecting next year from the 4.1% increase, not, not, not the last year. Um, I'm sure that could be clean, uh, cleared up. Um, the, the other point I had was just, just a point of clarification, really, just, just for my understanding of all of this. So in our key decision pack, slightly different agenda item, but, but there are two acquisitions referred to there. Um, of affordable homes, one at North Stowe, one at Gamlin Gay. Now, I couldn't find any reference to those in this um, in this budget. Does, does that mean that those purchases of houses are not part of the HRA account and fall somewhere else in in the in the council's finances, or is there some reason, other reason, why I couldn't? And, and again, maybe me just missing it. Um, I couldn't find a reference to those purchases in this document. Thank you. Peter, can you help us with that? Uh, I'm just looking through P uh, other Peter's report, uh, but normally the, uh, I, I think the main report that you've got uh, refers to the revenue aspect of the HRA, uh, and there's also a, a, a capital reserve as well. Uh, indeed, if you look at Appendix C, I just found it, um, which is the, the capital expenditure from the HRA, you will see that the new build, um, which is looking backwards, uh, it is, inc it is included there. Is it? Oops. Probably need to check that out. So thanks, thanks for the question there. Because um, I mean, there's a there's a number there's there's items in there that's unallocated now. Yeah. It's possible it needs to be fished out of that figure and identified separately. Um, Thank you for that point. We, we'll so, that. Sorry, Peter. But what it normally does is that I mean, yes, that that is currently unallocated. Uh, I need the decision is then made um, 
you know, as part of the key, uh, key decision which uh, Councillor Williams referred to, and then it, that, that, that amount, some of the amount, will be moved from the unallocated pile uh, into one which is uh, against that specific project. So it, 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 the, the unallocated amount is the amount that we've got uh, currently for, uh, um, uh, for future acquisitions. Uh, and it will be it, it will be moved uh, when uh, purchase decisions have been made. I think that means we'll have to come back to you on that detail in due course. Thanks, Councillor Steve Hunt. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I was looking at page 106, uh, paragraph 63, and uh, it's about the number of decent and, and non-decent houses. Um, and it's, it seems to be quite a large number of non-decent houses, if I'm reading this right, it's about one in 20 of them. Uh, and I do note that the figures are to be updated. And I was wondering, in, in the absence of the newest figures, or we can at least have an understanding whether it's going up or down, whether we're making headway on that. And also, this thing about um, access refused by tenants, is there anything we can do about that to, uh, to understand better the conditions of the properties that we have? Peter. I'll come in there. Um, property uh, numbers of uh, non decents do sometimes increase. Um, the measure of decency um, is in part based on the age of the components uh, within that property. Uh, and sometimes you get, you, sometimes you know, when, it, when a, a, um, a, a component re reaches a certain age, that can be treated as uh, uh, as not decent. For example, in my own home, which is now 21 years old since we purchased it, because the gas boiler is now more than 20 years old, it could be treated as non-decent. It still works properly, I'm still heated, but it, because we've got the time scale uh, as the measure, uh, that, that, that is an issue. Uh, and what we've not done is updated uh, it is um, been through and checked the condition of the, the report doesn't reflect the condition checks that we've made on some of the components. What we are going to do, um, as some members will be aware of through the asset management strategy, is during this year um, the intention is to carry out a stock condition survey as close to 100% as we can get. So rather than just relying on these um, uh, mathematical uh, models, we will be carrying out um, uh, proper surveys of each property uh, and all the components, uh, components within uh, and using those uh, revised figures um, for all future plans. Thank you, Peter. Um, Nigel, wants to come back. Uh, Nigel Cathcart, Councillor Nigel Cathcart, please. Well, thank you. Very briefly, thank you for letting me come back. There's just that the, uh, the garage is, I mean, this could be a valuable resource, I totally agree, but you need to be careful. In some cases, the garages are empty half the time in poor condition or let to people miles away. In some cases, they're fully used and in good condition. So it's courses for courses. Um, but I agree, we have a great variety of garage blocks in the district. But whilst we're talking about garages, I just really need to declare an interest because I used one of the garages, rent one of them from the council to store my vintage Riley's. So I should really declare an interest there, <laughs> which I thought didn't do before. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. In actual fact, I was going to ask a question about garages, or, or in particular garage rents. If we're putting up the price of housing rent by 4.1%, why don't we do the same with garages? But that might have been answered by the fact that we've got 350 empty ones. Uh, my other point was just in relation to the uh, rent arrears and the bad debt provision in particular. Uh, I noticed that it's, that was at 77% uh, of the March 2021 level. Uh, am I right in believing that we need to increase that provision by an additional 83,000? to take into account the increased level of arrears. I don't know which Peter will answer that. <laughs> well, I hope one of them, hope one of them will. I believe that's the case. Okay, thanks. I have no more speakers registered. Um, we are once again invited 
to take note of this report, to comment on it as it goes to uh, Cabinet. I think, once again, it's a very good report. Um, am I right in believing that the meeting is content with that and therefore we recommend this to Cabinet? Thank you all very much indeed. So we now go back to the original pack and we come to Agenda Item 10, which is the Treasury Management Strategy. And once again, I'll invite Councillor John Williams to introduce it, please. Oh, yeah, well, just, John, just before you do, we've been going for slightly over two hours. Would you like a five-minute break? Or would you like to carry on? Carry on? No break. Sorry, Councillor Williams. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, well, following the um, revised investment strategy, we have reviewed and revised the Treasury management strategy and also the capital strategy, which is the, the next report after this. The changes are in red, as, as we've done in the past, so you can see where we've made changes. Um, and again, um, these documents are work in progress, so there are figures that aren't in these documents at the moment, but obviously will be before they go to Cabinet. Thank you very much. Um, members, comments? I, I mean, <laughs> I think I would um, draw your attention, first of all, onto page 63, to that pie chart, which I can't read. I don't know whether anyone else can. It's probably better left out and certainly doesn't print. Um, but I think it's probably best to remove that. Uh, but members, any, uh, would anyone like to kick us off with the discussion? Councillor Graham Cohn. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just a, a quick one um, on uh, page 57, uh, 10.1 on the investment strategy. Um, I think this is just more my lack of understanding um, about this, but the, obviously the figures there have increased uh, quite a bit. Um, and then we, we've added in the fact that um, it, in red, that sentence about will reduce in forthcoming year as these figures include government COVID grants. It, uh, are, the, are the two figures including the COVID grants, was that saying in the, in the year subsequent to that I, I didn't I, I weren't quite sure if that was reflected in them and that was the, the bigger increase or, or not so, so part of the reason there was uh, we had a bit more invested than we would have had was because we got the COVID grants up front yeah. uh, and we invested it short term uh, until such time as we had to pay it out so we did we did have additional um, amounts invested simply because we got that money ahead of distribution. So it was just a one-off thing, really, effectively. Okay. Councillor Bradman. Thank you, Chair. Um, I simply wanted to draw our attention also on page 57 to the objectives in 10.2 and to say, what a relief to read that the authority's objective um, when investing money is to strike an appropriate balance between risk and return, minimizing the risk of incurring losses from defaults. So I'm just very glad that we're, we're being prudent. And actually, that message comes through loud and clear through all these reports. Um, and although that's just one, let's call it verbalization of it. Um, it. It exists throughout these reports, so I'm very reassured by them. Thank you. I think the key here is that we don't invest in Icelandic banks. Councillor Richard Williams. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Just a quick one. Um, on, on the yields, um, to pay page 63, I, I com completely see that you're, you're sticking to the current yield, even though um, CPI's gone up. I just wanted to ask, and I know this is a speculative question because it's about an uncertainty, but were inflation to stay significantly above that target into the next year, um, I mean, what would the 
strategy be if, if the decision was to, to, to raise the yield? I mean, how easily could, could that be done? I mean, we, we are rather driven by um, what we can get out in the market, and I think it's something we need to keep under review. I mean, we've generally been able to exceed the, the you know, 2% because, um, you know, clearly a lot of our money that we have out is with uh, Early Street, so we've generally been able to keep ahead of that. But, but even with the uh, good interest rates we get from that, we've got no chance of, of getting near it. So I think it's something we're going to need to keep under review pretty regularly just to see how best uh, best we tackle it but quite clearly we're not going to be able to achieve it at the moment so if anyone knows a bank that's giving a reasonable rate of return <laughs> will you please let me know because i am not found one yet well, me too yeah. Is there any other comments ladies and gentlemen once again it's a very detailed report um is everyone content that we take note and move it on to cabinet in due course. Thank you all very much indeed. So we come now to uh, item 11. If I can find the appropriate page. Item, well, I think we've done item 10 and 11 together, have we not? Oh, no, we've got the capital strategy. My apologies. Yeah, thank you, John. Yeah, capital strategy, and once again, that's over, over to you to present. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Well, again, as, as with the Treasury Management Strategy, uh, the changes are in red. Um, with the capital strategy, we have had to make a, a change because of the introduction of the infrastructure um, funding statement, which you, we're now required to do. Um, so that, but also, um, we've, we've also looked at um, taking the opportunity to revise it, given the change to the PWLB uh, yeah. rules. And so you'll see in paragraph 9.3, we have also taken the opportunity to amend it to, um, to say that there is now a presumption against investments made purely for yield. Thank you very much. Members, Councillor Bradman. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm going to say it again. I'm really reassured, paragraph 8.5 on page 98, that the Council's policy on Treasury investment is to prioritise security and liquidity over yield, that is to focus on minimising risk rather than maximising returns, and I absolutely applaud that, and I'm very relieved to see it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other, no, uh, any other comments from members? No? Are we... Therefore, minded to once again to uh, take note of this and um, send it forward for consideration by Cabinet in due course. Thank you all very much. We now come to item 12, which is the work programme. And I would simply ask you to take note of that. Um, I think we've got some busy meetings ahead of us to come. And we then move on to item 13, and I would ask you to take note that the next scheduled meeting of the Scrutiny and Overview Committee will be on Thursday, the 3rd of March, 2022, at 5.20 p.m. Um, with that brings us to the conclusion of our business this evening. Uh, could I thank the officers, both those here with us and those who joined us remotely, uh, my thanks to, to all your members for your contributions this evening. Once again, it's been, I think, a very helpful meeting. Thank you all very much. I wish you a safe journey home. Martin, did you wish to say something? Uh, I just want to highlight that uh, I received my uh, agenda this morning. It had been posted on time, so there were delays in the post, and, and the uh, officers might wish to take notice of that. And, uh, did, did you receive all your agenda this morning, or just the... The, the second part? All my agendas and also the planning committee. 
which is up tomorrow, which is also, so they've both been delayed. There's obviously postage problems. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that's something local to your area. Certainly mine, mine arrived the, the latest part by Saturday morning. So I've had, a, I've had a little more time to look at it. But, uh, really? Oh my goodness. Well, um, are, we, are we offline, Rebecca?